let's cultivate our motivation. So when we look at it, uh, when we say I, we are doing that on the basis of there being a collection of body and mind. So there's just that collection of body and mind. And that's all. And the body is not a person. It's just a bunch of organic matter. The mind isn't a person. It's simply clarity and cognizance. And yet, independence on these two, when they're together, a person appears, and we think that there's a unique individual with a special personality. or some, some specialness that makes that individual who they are. And yet there's only, really, simply a body and mind, neither of which are the person. So this whole uh, appearance of this uniquely qualified individual who is me is simply something added on top of the body and mind. But not recognizing that, we believe that there indeed is this independent person with their own special personality and feelings and everything unique about us. So we believe that appearance. The appearance is false. But then, believing it, then we relate to the rest of the world through that kind of image of ourselves. So everybody else becomes other, and being attached to ourselves, then we want what makes this special, unique person, me, happy. We want to get rid of what makes this special, unique person unhappy. And so that's the lens through which we view all the rest of the universe. So it's actually quite a distorted lens. So no wonder there's uh, misery. We experience misery and internal conflict and conflict with others as well. So having met the Dharma, we're quite fortunate that we have the chance to see this and having seen it, to begin to counteract it and prove to ourself that the way things appear to us is not actually how they exist. By training ourselves in a new view that is correct, then 
we become free. And so that's what real freedom, real liberation is. So let's aim for that for ourselves and for all other living beings as well. Okay, so last night, um, Venerable Domcha emailed me something from one of uh, Jeffrey's books about the the Jeter Madra scriptural proponents, the ones who said that there were three, you know, yeah. So she thought that that might make Rebecca feel better because there was one kind that, uh, how did you put it, um, that they can switch, you know, they have an indefinite, so that she thought that might make you feel better. Unfortunately, the you know, I'm going to expand on the Cheetah Madra thing, and it'll probably make you feel worse. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, if you wanted more on the, that particular Cheetah Madra group. So the Cheetah Madra scriptural proponents, but not the reasoning proponents, say that there are three final vehicles. That is, not everybody will attain Buddhahood. So some people uh, will practice the hearer or uh, solitary realizer vehicle, attain the goal of liberation, and abide in that state forever without entering the bodhisattva vehicle and becoming a Buddha. So they base this on saying and this is their their theory, that there are five types of lineage, five types of disposition, okay? So this is kind of uh, another way of translating the word that's often translated as Buddha nature, okay? Five types of disposition or lineage, meaning kind of the who you're going to follow, what you're going to become, Okay, so there's the hearer, solitary realizer, bodhisattva lineages. Okay, so far, so good, you know. Okay, then there's the the indefinite lineage, and there's the absent, ones that are absent of a lineage. So here, lineage connotes a source of good qualities, Okay, or a disposition, you know, the way you're going to go. So it is, it is an internal disposition that exists naturally in the foundation of consciousness that uh, inclines sentient beings towards one vehicle or another. So it just is naturally there. Nobody gives it to you. Yeah, they're not, it's not like Halloween where you get different candy from somebody, you know, nobody's going to give you a different lineage. It's just natural. Why people have different natural lineages? I don't know. Ask, pl- please ask a, a Chinamaja scriptural proponent, because they that's what they believe. They may be able to answer it better than me. Okay, but this uh, internal disposition can be, can also be impeded from manifesting. Um, and uh, what comes next here, too, I would say, uh, applies also to the Madhyamaka view about things that can Im- impede us from um, understanding our Buddha nature, or in the case of evolving Buddha nature, from developing it. Okay, so things that uh, can get in the way, okay, when we have great attachment or very strong afflictions of one sort or another. Okay, when we're too busy to be interested in spiritual matters, when we don't see the fault of the afflictions, or think that our actions lack uh, a an ethical dimension, when we have physical or mental hindrances such as illness or poverty, or very strong karmic obscurations. So, 
those uh, things are going to impede that internal disposition from manifesting. Okay, because, and we can easily see lots of people have these hindrances. Yeah, I'm always amazed when I go to Bodh Gaya, which from a Buddhist viewpoint, you know, the holiest place on this planet. And they're the people who are selling tea opposite from the stupa. And then there are other people who are selling little Buddhist trinkets but no thought of, you know, these tr- these trinkets have some special meaning or value or the stupa has, you know, some significance. Just, you know, this is a place to make some money for my family. That's all. The only interest they have in it. Okay. Uh, my own family, I've tried to arrange so many times for them to go to His Holiness's talks or different things. No karma. You know, we finally managed to get my dad here, which was really surprising. Yeah. But it's just like no car. Even His Holiness was teaching like about three miles away from where they lived. They couldn't go. Huh? So you really see this kind of thing. Okay. So, uh, you know, where the lineage cannot, uh, you know, the disposition cannot ripen. So, in fact, our own spiritual inclination can sometimes lack energy. (laughs) Do we have any of the aforementioned obstacles? Yeah. Things we can do uh, to increase our practice are to learn and reflect on the teachings, to live in an in an environment with people that is conducive to practice, to aspire for virtuous qualities, to really make that part of our lives is generating many uh, virtuous aspirations, to restrain our senses, you know, so that our we're not always glued to external objects, looking for something that's amusing, looking for something that's pleasurable. Yeah, so restraining the senses and looking inward more. Um, to abandon non-virtuous actions. Yeah, to take precepts, to purify obscurations, and so on. So people who follow the hearer path have particular signs, okay? They have strong renunciation of samsara. They avoid non-virtue and purify their destructive actions. They are very moved when they hear teachings on the four truths and also the 12 links of dependent origination, how we enter into and leave from samsara. They live ethically because they want to avoid unfortunate rebirths and want to have good ones. And they take precepts uh, with the motivation, with the desire to attain liberation. And they dedicate all the virtue from their practice towards their own freedom from uh, from samsara. Okay. So this, so those are the solitary realizers. This, the, the signs of those following. I mean, that was the fundamental. The um, hearers. Okay. So the sign of the solitary realizers, they have few aff- afflictions and weak compassion, uh, so that they uh, dislike busyness and they prefer solitude. Mm-hmm. They're very moved by the teaching on the twelve links especially even more than the than the uh, than the hearers are and because you know the 12 links describe how we enter into and leave samsara and their motivation and dedication is directed towards the solitary realizer vehicle and the attainment of our hardship okay all makes sense Okay, so the signs of those who um, have the disposition for the bodhisattva vehicle or the the Mahayana, the universal vehicle, 
Okay, so those people also have many of the qualities of the hearers, you know, and in addition, um, they are naturally empathetic and compassionate. They aspire to practice the six perfections, uh, and they have the fortitude to engage in the bodhisattva's deeds. Uh, they want to work for the welfare of sentient beings, and their motivation and dedication is towards full awakening. Okay, so you can see that like three kind of clear dispositions, just tendencies, you know, kind of. We see now, you know, everybody here is different. We have different tendencies towards different things, not just spiritually, but, you know, and other things too. Yeah, some people like pickles for breakfast. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I bring this up because um, Venerables Lo Sang and, and Pende left for Taiwan for their ordination. And one of my memories of my full ordination was pickles for breakfast. <laughs> uh, luckily, I remember some other things about that month too. <laughs> Otherwise, I might be like Jeff Sessions, who doesn't remember anything. <laughs> okay, he remembers a few things selectively. These signs des uh, describing those inclined towards the here, solitary realizer, and bodhisattva paths are similar. For example, all three avoid negativity, create merit. Okay. But their motivation and the way they carry it out and the goal that they dedicate for are different. Okay. The persons of these three lineages are definite in their path. Yeah, They will not switch vehicles, but will proceed to the attainment of their own vehicle. Okay, So they have this disposition, they enter that vehicle, they go to the end. Okay, they don't, uh, you know, get off on a new highway exit and go somewhere else. Okay, they, they stay on what they, they started on. Now, the fourth uh, lineage, yeah, the fourth kind of disposition is those of indefinite lineage. Okay, so uh, the the... At the moment, uh, right now, which vehicle these people will enter is uncertain. It's not clear. And it depends on what spiritual mentor they meet and how they are introduced to the Dharma. Okay, so that make, is going to make a big difference. So depending on the teacher they meet, how they're introduced to the Dharma, what they're taught at the beginning, yeah, then they will later develop an inclination towards one vehicle or the other. Yeah. Um, and also those of indefinite lineage may begin practicing the Dharma in one vehicle and later switch to another. Yeah, but the, that's just that, that certain group. Then, the bad news. Okay, but this is the, the Chitta Madra uh, um, scriptural proponents. It's, it's not the Madhyamakas. And we are Madhyamakas. Let's hear it for the Madhyamakas. Yay. Yay! We don't understand what it means, but we're it. <laughs> and it's our team. So it's got to be the best one. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so the this group um, that they're, they're called uh, the Sanskrit term is is uh, ichantika. Okay, uh, and these beings are the they lack uh, a, a disposition either temporarily or perpetually, and will not taint, attain either liberation or awakening. So these people have little merit, great negativity, no integrity or consideration for how their actions affect other living beings, 
and no wish to abandon non-virtue. Yeah, sometimes we meet people that seem to have those qualities, don't we? Yeah. Even if they dabble in the Dharma, their motivation seeks is one seeking the pleasures of samsara. They want a wowie kazawi experience. They want to become famous because they know the Dharma or whatever. Okay, they lack renunciation of uh, the dukkha of samsara and they are unable and cannot generate great compassion or bodhicitta. So these beings are in big trouble. Okay. So the sublime continuum by Maitreya and Asanga's commentary on it also discuss this topic. Okay. So uh, they say that there's that there's only one final vehicle that you know people who enter here here are solitary realizer vehicles will eventually enter the Mahayana and become Buddhas. And they say that everybody has the possibility to become a Buddha. Okay, there's nobody who lacks that possibility. Okay, but they do speak of four types of people whose Buddha nature is defiled in the sense that they are not yet ready to enter the bodhisattva vehicle, engage in the two collections of merit and wisdom, and progress on the path to full awakening. Okay, so these these four groups of people. Okay, first is worldly people. So people who just average Joe Blow, you know, who enjoys samsara, doesn't think about uh, spiritual matters, the purpose of their life is to experience pleasure and avoid pain. Uh, there's no thought about the meaning of life. There's no attempt to restrain the senses. There's no thought of what happens after death. So, you know, kind of like m- many people. Yeah. Then the other and second group is non-Buddhists who have wrong views. So remember, these are people who are not yet ready to enter the bodhisattva path. It doesn't mean they lack Buddha nature. It means they're not yet ready to enter the bodhisattva path. So clearly non-Buddhists who have wrong views, they're not going to be interested in the bodhisattva path to start with. So of course they're not going to enter it. Okay, hearers and solitary realizers, similarly, not so interested in the bodhisattva path. Yeah. And it may, you know, for me, it's like I would go, how can somebody not be interested in the bodhisattva path? You know, with the talk, talk about great love and great compassion and bodhicitta and working for the benefit of others, and how can somebody not be interested in this? And um, and so it was very interesting f- for me when I uh, spent some time in Thailand at a, a monastery there and talked to some of the monastics. These were the Western monastics that I talked with and, uh, and heard them say things like, bodhicitta is unrealistic. You know, you can't liberate all living beings. Huh? I'm so surprised. You mean... There's really people who think that, you know, like it's just, it's impractical. And the best, uh, you know, the best thing I can do for others is to get myself out of samsara. And, you know, what can I really do to help them? And it, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I've got to get myself out. I was very surprised to hear this, but you know, it's people who have, who are at this moment anyway, inclined in that kind of direction. Okay, Um, the Madhyamakas also discuss the specific obscurations. Uh, Oh, it's very interesting in in, uh, the Sublime Continuum. They talk about the specific obscurations that each group of people have and what the antidotes are to those obscurations. It's quite detailed, very interesting. 
Yeah, and in that case, Asanga is writing, uh, in Gyulama, he's writing from the viewpoint of the Madhyamakas. Yeah, whereas often in his other teachings, uh, it's from the viewpoint of the Chidamadra scriptural proponents, or at least people after him took his teachings that way. Okay. So the fourth group was the solitary realizers? Yeah. Here's the three. Solitary realizers are four. So they're not yet ready to enter the Bodhisattva vehicle. Yeah. Is this copying through appearance? Uh, no, it was in... Uh, reflections on reality. Reflections on reality, okay. Uh, was there any... Uh, but what I wrote up is is from the book. It's not from Jeffrey. It's not out of... It's based on what he wrote, but not... Is there any scriptural reference for these five... Yeah, there's probably things that a, a sangha wrote, and I can't remember the sutra. If it, there's got to be a sutra reference. I can't. I don't know. Somehow, this Lankavatara is coming into my mind, but don't take that. That may be totally wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be. Uh, let me see if it, if I have it here. No. Um, yeah, unless it's something that the Chidamadra scriptural proponents kind of deduced based on different scriptures. Yeah, or it might be. Uh, you know what? It probably has to do with the Tathagata. Tathagarbha Sutra. That's probably the one. Okay. And then I was thinking a little bit, you know, our discussion about permanence and impermanence. And it seems like, you know, in our Western culture, we have the idea when the when there's certain principles like the principle of impermanence or the principle of gravity. Or the, you know, what are other, the laws of nature, things like that, that we look at those and we, according to how we describe permanent and impermanent, we think of those, those laws as permanent. In other words, this is a law of nature, always has been, always will be, so it must be permanent. Okay, but that's not the meaning of permanent from a Buddhist perspective, because that meaning of permanent, the how we think of it, is meaning forever, you know, like gravity has existed before, it exists now, it'll exist in the future. <coughs> Same with impermanence. Nobody created these things. These are just natural laws, natural principles. So we tend to think of them as some kind of absolute in some way or some kind of principles in and of themselves that govern the world that nobody invented, nobody created. We just happen to discover them. And so it's because we think of them in that way that then we tend to think of them as our definition of permanent, meaning eternal and, uh, yeah, and maybe not subjected to causes and conditions because this is just the nature of things. Nobody created these natural laws, okay? But in Buddhism, that's not the exact meaning of impermanent, okay, first of all. Then second of all, all these different principles, you don't, there, uh, when we talk about categories of of uh, impermanent phenomena, there's three types. One is um, what they call form, which could include matter, material things, you know, anything that can transform into matter and out of matter. The second is mind or consciousness. And the third is a group called abstract composites. And that means anything that's impermanent, that's not either material or consciousness. 
So all these different natural laws and principles, they fall into that category. So they're considered impermanent things, but they're not matter and they're not consciousness. Okay? But, and, and by the way, the person, the I, is also included in, the, in that category. Because the person itself is not material and it's not mental. It's something, it's impermanent, but something other than those two. Okay? So, um, but what's interesting is for these other, these impermanent abstract phenomena, the way you know them is you have to see some other impermanent abstract phenomena yeah, first. So in the case of knowing the person, you either see the body, hear the voice. If you're clairvoyant, you know their mind. Okay, that's how you know the person. So you know it by seeing some other impermanent thing. Democracy would fall into this category too. We don't see democracy directly. We see people campaigning, people voting. We have see different institutions, legal, executive, legislative. And on the basis of this, we know there's democracy. Yeah. In the same way for impermanence, for example, we see material things and how they change. And if you have really excellent concentration, you see that in every uh, nanosecond and even smaller units than nanoseconds, things are changing and they don't remain the same. And on the basis of seeing those things that are changing quickly, then we say, oh, there's impermanence. Yeah. On the basis of seeing uh, things fall down, <laughs> yeah, and then of course measuring, you know, all the things that all the formulas for for uh, figuring out their you know how fast they fall down and all this then we call it uh, gravity okay but these these laws of nature these yeah uh, and and other abstract uh, composites they're all impermanent okay from a Buddhist viewpoint because, you know, we understand them based on seeing other things that are impermanent. Mm -hmm. uh, question related to what's permanent and impermanent, but also related to what you said earlier in terms of the Chitta Matra scriptural view of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, it applies to all of them, my question, but is particularly um, uh, triggered by the description of the indefinite lineage things. Uh -huh. Because I think it would fly in the face of cause and effect that there would be beings who are not able to change from their disposition into a different disposition. Yeah. Right. Now that's from our viewpoint. This particular school says that all these dispositions are inherently existent. Yes. That means they don't depend on other factors. Okay. You just have your disposition. If it's something independent and doesn't depend on other factors, then it's not going to be able to change. So then... This is their position. This is how we refute their position. Okay? Yeah. I'm not defending their position. I'm explaining this is what they believe. But we refute that because we say... Nothing is inherently existent, and these things are, you know, influenced by other factors. Okay? Okay, yeah? Um, I had a doubt about that line when I read it, because um, Chittamantrans hold that everything inherently exists. Yes. So if everything inherently exists, and it couldn't depend on anything, and I don't think they assert that. I think they... Yeah, they, they say everything they, inherently exists. And everything doesn't truly exist. It's only certain things truly exist, but yeah. everything inherently exists. Yeah. Um, and I think they follow the other schools in saying that that means that mm -hmm. um, 
an illustration of something can be found when sought. So an illustration read, can be found what? When it's sought among the bases. Uh, yeah, they say the foundation consciousness is the person. Right, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know why they would say that those lineages can't change, but I, I have a doubt about that reason. For, because they say all things inherent. What, what you, your doubt is why they say they can't change. Yeah. Yeah, that's something you have to ask them. I can't answer that. Yeah, because I don't agree with what they're saying. So, <laughs> yeah. It's like sometimes people come to me and they say, so-and-so did that. Why did they do that? It's like, I have no idea. Ask them, you know? So same, like some why why these people say that I have no idea, you know. But but you know you can see if you think of a foundation consciousness and you say that's the person, yeah, then you're isolating something that is the person. So if there is, you know. Uh, something that is the person, maybe that person has a specific disposition or lineage. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps that's how they would justify it. But again, it's hard for me to explain because I don't agree with what they're saying. Okay. And it's interesting in, in Jeffrey's thing, he, he didn't explain it either. I don't know if we asked him that. We may have asked him that. Yeah. But I don't remember ever hearing an explanation on. But it fits with saying that the foundation consciousness is the person. Yeah. There's a real person, and that real person has a specific lineage. Yeah. It kind of, you know what it fits in with is how some people view uh, family lineages. That, uh, you know, you're born into this family, and so therefore, you know, this is what you're like, and this is what you do. You know, kind of, it's, you know, like in the caste system, or many people, you know, even nowadays, you're born as a, you know, whatever you are, you know, the descendants of what is it, the, um, you know, the daughters of the American Revolution, the sons of the Confederacy, the, they have another one, what, from the, the Puritans, what's it called? Some other group, you know, but like you are born in, in that lineage, and so somehow your blood, your genes, something in you is, uh, you know, affiliated with that, and that's not going to change. Yeah? Now, sometimes ethnic identities, I was born in an ethnic group, and you have that, and you don't change. Yeah? But this is the kind, you know, that's the view of certain people, but... That doesn't mean we have to agree with it. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's the way, I mean, the Madhyamaka view gives you much space. You're not your body, you're not your mind. Yeah. That means, and your body and mind are dependent on other factors. So that means everything can change, everything can evolve, nothing is fixed at all. Yeah. So that view gives you you lots of uh, mental space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But on the other hand, I keep opening and closing this book <laughs> as I think of more and more ideas. <laughs> You know, for some people, the idea that there is a soul or a self is very comforting. The Madhyamaka view is really disconcerting for some people. To think I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, there's nothing I can pinpoint that's me. Ah! But for, and so those people, you know, to think, oh, I was created by a deity, I have a soul, there's something that is 
really me, you know, that's stable, that's me, that's not going to change, you know, that was created by, you know, somebody else. And then that gives them a sense of emotional security that is very, very important for them. Yeah. And so that's why from a Buddhist viewpoint, we don't go to people who have other views like belief in a soul and a creator and say, hey, guys, you know, you're all wrong. And you know where you're going for believing that. Um, No, we don't say that because that is a, a view that suits their karma that suits their personality and it benefits them and they create virtue based on that view whereas if you try and teach them you know about the madhyamaka view of emptiness they're going to misunderstand it and think you're saying nothing exists and then that view will give them reason to just completely disregard ethical principles altogether and that would be really damaging for them whereas if they think you know god created me i have a soul okay there's something stable god this is you know god dictated what i should do and not do i trust god i'm doing that and so they act ethically and you know abandon non-virtue and create virtue then that's that's helpful to them we're not going to go and tell these people, you know, oh, your, your philosophy's all wrong. If they come to us and they want to discuss and they're open-minded, then, yes, we discuss and we debate and all of that happens. Yeah, but we're not going to try and make everybody into a Buddhist because it doesn't, it doesn't suit everybody's mentality. Yeah. So there's many things how other people think that we scratch our head at and go, how in the world do they believe that? But for them, it makes perfect sense. Okay? But what makes sense to somebody and what can be proven by reasoning are two different things. Okay? They're not the same thing. So His Holiness always stresses for us to use reasoning instead of the reason of, I, it makes me feel good. Yeah, that reason, we use that reason a lot in our life. Yeah, it makes me feel good. Yeah, why is that a good reason? Yeah, I just told somebody off, and it made me feel good. Okay, but does that mean it's something to go around doing, and it's going to, create happiness in the world? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Do any of the traditions talk about changing vehicles from one life to the next and whether maybe it makes sense in one life to follow one vehicle and then switch the next life? Um, I, I, I haven't heard them directly talk about that, you know. Um, I think pretty much once you enter into one of the vehicles, yeah, they do talk about their levels. At there are certain stages in the solitary realizer and here vehicles where you can transfer to the bodhisattva vehicle. There's, yeah, they do talk about that certain levels, but that those are people who have entered a path. As far as the rest of us, you know, there's a lot of change from one life to the next. How would you know if you've entered a path, for sure? Okay, well, in the, um, <laughs> in, in the three principles of the path, it gives us some definitions, yeah? So you enter the path, the hearer path, if you have day and night the intention to attain liberation and be free of samsara, Okay. So I look at that definition, it's very clear to me I haven't entered the hearer path. Okay? Then, bodhisattva path. Yeah, the demarcation is spontaneous bodhicitta, 
you know, the wish to benefit and lead a, every sentient beings to enlightenment whenever you see sentient beings. I don't have that response towards all sentient beings <laughs> automatically either. I haven't entered that vehicle. Yeah, I'm still one of these people that they talk about, like in the in the second verse of uh, the foundation of all good qualities, or second or third verse, where you talk somebody who sees the splendors of samsara. Yeah. Ooh, here's something interesting in samsara. I can travel here. I can go there. I can get this. I can that, get that. I can, you know, be popular. I can be famous. I can be, yeah. So as long as that kind of thing is something that you get real excited about, you haven't, you're, we're in the category of these worldly people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It would seem then that everybody has to enter the hearer path first because to generate bodhicitta, you need renunciation. The, um, it would seem that way, but it, it's not that way because you can generate, uh, at, you know, um, renunciation of samsara, but without it being, I'm only interested in my own liberation. Yeah, which is why our teachers really, you know, we get so many teachings on bodhicitta, and we're really, it's emphasized to us to always just even create, uh, contrive bodhicitta, because then when we have renunciation or the determination to be free, it won't just be for our own self. Okay, we may not have generated full bodhicitta, but we'll have so much imprint in our mind about uh, the bodhisattva vehicle that we won't enter the hearer vehicle. Okay, so that's why it's so much emphasized to us. Okay, so much of the path, much of what we're doing is we are planting seeds in our mind stream. Okay, so we're the whole idea of you know we're we're planting send planting seeds. We're encouraging different tendencies and dis, different dispositions in our mind that may not ripen fully in this life, but will create the tendency for us to go in one direction or another direction. And it's very important to create these kinds of things because they will influence what, our, what we do in our future lives, which will influence what vehicle we, we enter. Okay? So it, it's the same kind of way, like you see little children, you know, and some little kids are just naturally compassionate, you know, even towards animals. And some little kids are naturally vicious. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that they are inherently vicious or inherently compassionate. It's just certain tendencies that they have according to what they're familiar with from past life. So when we learn about karma and this whole idea of conditioning, then what we're trying to do in this life a lot is condition ourselves to go in the kind of direction that to become the kind of person and spiritual practitioner and do the kind of things that we, we really admire and and that we want to become and so we learn we may not know anything about the bodhisattva vehicle but you hear about it and you hear about the qualities of a bodhisattva and the qualities of the buddha and then your mind goes wow you know that's terrific i want to become like that well what do i need to become like that well here's this whole path now how am i going to complete that whole path in this life you know, I mean, maybe if I were somebody really fantastic, I could do it. But, you know, I don't know. So what do I do? I familiarize myself with all these different parts of the path as much as I can. If I familiarize myself well, maybe I'll gain some realizations in this life. If 
if I still haven't familiarized myself enough, then at least I'm planting all those seeds, making those ideas familiar in my mind. Then next life, yeah, then maybe when I'm a little kid, I'll be interested in the Dharma, and I'll be able to meet the Dharma when I'm a little kid. Yeah, some of you are meeting the Dharma in, you know, your 20s. Very fortunate. Other people didn't have the karma to do that. Yeah, so that fortune comes because you put some, you know, seeds in your mind. And the people who met the Dharma later, also they put a lot of seeds in their mind. It just took a while longer for those seeds to ripen. Okay, but once those seeds ripen, yeah, then look, you're taking off and you're doing wonderful things in your practice. Whereas some of the people who meet the Dharma when they're young, you know, had the seeds to meet the Dharma when they're young, and then they just get totally lost in samsara, and that's it. So everybody has quite different karma and different seeds, and that's why it's so important to create a lot of virtue and create those seeds and to dedicate them so that they will ripen in the way we want. Because you don't want to create seeds to meet the Dharma when you're young and then, you know, kind of like, well, actually, you know, I'd rather, you know, join the NFL or I'd rather uh, do this and that, you know, go to Antarctica and investigate the, the ice thing or I'd rather, you know, do something else. And and then the, you had some karma there, it ripened and there was no karma to keep it, keep it going. Or maybe there was karma to keep it going, but you didn't dedicate your virtue for that. Yeah, you dedicated your virtue, you know, for something else. Yeah, or maybe some big, uh, uh, you know, affliction completely came and over, overwhelmed you, and, you know, off you went to, to do something else. So, you know, this is very much a thing of habituation, planting seeds, dedicating, motivating properly. Yeah. And then... Because cause and effect works, yeah, when all the causes and conditions come together, the effect comes. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, just focus on creating the kind of causes for what you want to become spiritually. I guess I always thought I was a little bit above sort of the um, cultural oblivion. I was born and raised somewhere else, and I've always traveled, but, but being here, like... My entire life, because you can you you can accomplish everything in this life based on Western culture. As far as like I was a kickboxer, you train, then you fight, you get a degree, so then you do it. You get a degree, you get a job, and everything's realizable and measurable in this lifetime. I think that's almost the most overwhelming thing is that you can do everything in this lifetime that you're aware of right now. It's just not enough in Buddhism. The fact that it's going to carry over and over and over. So for someone like myself, I'm 41, and it's like it's just really intimidating not to be able to. I don't know, it's just intimidating. You know, it's a little overwhelming that you're not, even if you were full tilt into it, you know, like we need these people in this room that it takes more than this lifetime. Yeah. But it's much uh, what you become is much better than becoming an athlete or a teacher or an engineer or a whatever it is. Because those things you become in this life, when you die, they're gone finished yeah whereas you train yourself spiritually those kinds of things are going to carry on from life to life it's such a juxtaposition with western culture where that's almost it's not even it's not emphasized i mean you don't really even hear of it in yeah. school or in law or in economics or politics everything is Doesn't this mean, life yes. isn't it yeah. instant gratification I mean, even the good stuff is instant. Like, oh, have a family, have kids. You know, it's just, yeah, everything's here and now. And it's just, it's so yeah. contrary. Right. Yeah. Very good observation. And it's because things are like that, that then we get distracted from our long-term goals. Yeah. Yeah. Because the immediacy of oh, what I can get this lifetime. <laughs> Yeah, 
But don't worry about being 41. Yeah. Whenever you meet the Dharma, that's good. And you practice and it benefits you. We have, uh, yeah, how old were you when you met the Dharma? I remember when the seed was planted and I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I was uh, what, 19 or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's some, that sounds like a really interesting thing to happen. And so I'll get around to it. I think maybe when I'm 50, I'll wait. In the meantime, I'm going to see what this life is about. And maybe I'll know enough about this life by the time I'm 50 to go on and look to another aspect. And I devoted my life in that very conscious way. Mm. So it was, so I said 50, but actually it took me till 60. Uh, Before okay. I really got serious <laughs> about it, I mean, you know, there were too many. There were other obstacles in the way. Yeah. So, uh, so it's since then, though, that uh, I've divided, decided that my inner life is more important mm. to then, which is how I planned it in the first place. Yeah. You know? yeah. But one thing that I really bothers me is to say. Uh, what you can get in this life. I don't think of it that way. I think mm-hmm. it's what you can do in this life. Yeah, what you can give in this life. And what you can give in this yeah. life. Yeah. What and you can that's do. an orientation of the mind, yeah. isn't it? Okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, so I think I hear exaggeration of, of what happens in this life and there are a lot of good things that uh, people are devoted to and you know would fit into the dharma that's just that's not what they're uh, thinking about so yeah. i think it's unfair sometimes to ignore those things that exist oh in this okay life. well we're not trying to ignore the good I things <laughs> people do and we're not saying only buddhists create virtue not by any means no there's a lot of people doing a lot of good things you know that, but uh, okay. the way I hear it, you know, just yeah. forget. Okay. Uh, oh, but I just want to mention, we have um, Bob and Vita. How old were they? How old was Bob when he met the Dharma? Eight, no, 70s, maybe 80s, I don't know. But, you know, kind of this older couple... And they met the Dharma, and it was like boing for both of them. Amazing, you know. And he died just a few years after meeting the Dharma. But having met the Dharma completely changed the rest of his life, and also how he died. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, he had like two or three years. Yeah. Yeah, he was healthy, and then he, he got sick, yeah. Uh, I've heard um, from many people uh, in previous lives have come to a very high level of attainment or, or reaching the final stage and then fall. Um, is is that common amongst Buddhist tradition to know that? Mm. Uh, if you've entered certain levels of the path, you don't fall from those. But it takes a while before we actually enter a path. And so people can seem quite advanced, but actually they haven't entered the path yet. And so if those people actually can fall. If there's no beginning or end, what's the urgency that's expressed? Like I can, uh-huh. I can get to whatever point I do in this life and then throw it all away, go through eons upon eons of hell realm rebirths and based on the probability of infinite lifetimes at some point i'm going to be back to here Uh uh-huh okay do you want to go through eons of hellish rebirth not necessarily but once (laughs) once i that's good but once i potentially attain realization time is Time is a convention, and that infinity of hellish rebirths, well, it was an an infinity of everything. 
it, it, first of all, hellish, you know, none of our rebirths are infinite. They last only as long as the causal energy for them. I meant the fact that there would be an infinite yeah. number. I, I think this whole thing is based on the fact that most people would like to avoid suffering of any kind whenever they can. And most people would like to have happiness soon. And if you have the intention to to really help benefit others, then you want to be able to benefit them sooner rather than later because you want them to be happier sooner rather than later. So it's based on that premise. I was reading that some someone was asked uh, what happens when everybody attains Buddhahood eventually. And the person said that assumes... What, what you're asking is what happens once everybody's enlightened, does everything just the samsara, and when there's nobody in samsara anymore. And he said that assumes that everybody will enter realization, which they won't because there's an infinite amount of sentient beings. Yeah, some people answer the question that way. Yeah, I always answer the question, uh, you know, of what happens when everybody's enlightened by saying we'll worry about that problem when it happens. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it just seems like the urgency can only be viewed from a self-centered place that grasps at the urgency of time. No, because you could want people, other people, to be free of suffering sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if, if we had... Um, Memories of, you know, many, many previous lifetimes, it might, um, or, or even, you don't have memories, even this lifetime, you know, if you've gone through a period of intense suffering, when you're in the middle of it, you don't think this is going to end. You feel like, I'm in this forever, and you have that suffering plus the mind that is very small and says this is lasting forever. When you're in the middle of that suffering, wouldn't you rather be free sooner than later? Wouldn't you rather prevent yourself from getting into that state to start with? So, you know, the urgency comes from that but it's not this panicked urgency of, we got to do it sound or else it's just you know if we can prevent suffering let's prevent it nobody likes it and i'm and i'm not against that whatsoever it's just and i'm willing to do that whether it makes logical sense or not it's just, it's just that in since in my next life Okay. I could do something that completely disregards everything I've done in this life. Oh, like, that's... It doesn't necessarily seem logical. Okay. If that's why we do a lot of purification and creation of merit in this lifetime, so that at the time we die, you know, we can have a virtuous mental state that will make the seeds of some virtuous karma ripen so that next lifetime we will have a beneficial lifetime and uh, a fortunate rebirth and be able to continue on the path. Okay, so it's not, don't just say to yourself, oh, you know, I'm going to lose all this le next lifetime, so what's the use? You know, this thing of people going up and down and up and down so much in samsara is because they don't know how to use the principle of dependent arising to create the causes and get rid for goodness and happiness and diminish the causes from suffering. So for those people who, you know, have don't care about any of that, yeah, then they go up and down and up and down and up and down. You know, the rest of us, yes, it's true. You know, maybe we're, we're like intent this life on purification and creation of merit, but we may have some very heavy negative karma from a previous life that if we don't purify it this lifetime, and if there are certain conditions at the time we die such that that karma ripens, then we could go from a precious human life down and have a horrible life. 
Or if we create, despite our practicing the Dharma now, we still create a lot of negative karma. Yeah, and we could create some horrible negative karma this lifetime that could throw us to an unfortunate rebirth next lifetime. So we have to be careful about these things. We don't just assume, well, I've met the Dharma, so everything's going up. Uh Uh-uh. Yeah, but also don't assume that you're going to lose everything next life. Okay. Okay, shall we come back? to the Chan tradition. (laughs) Okay. So I must say before reading this section, uh, I haven't studied the Chan tradition in depth. Yeah. And uh, I realize that that, uh, the way some... um, the way the teachings are presented in different cultures and uh, even within one culture to people who have different ways of thinking, the teachings are presented differently. And so I've seen that some traditions uh, explain things, you know, like, okay, here's this and here are the categories and here's the definition of all the categories and this means that and it doesn't mean this. And then other traditions explain the teachings and they don't give you the definitions so much and they don't tell you the categories. And it's kind of like poetry in a way. The explanation is much more poetic where it points towards something but it doesn't tell you exactly what's there. Okay? So I think here, you know, at least... uh, in this, the usual kind of chant, that's what's happening. Um, there, there was one uh, Chan master, uh, Venerable Yinshan, who who lived in the twentieth century. I can't remember when he passed away. If it was, I can't. Yeah. Anyway, um, but people I know were his students, and he was a really great master, and he. Uh, brought in a lot of, you know, he he studied Jason Kappa's tradition, and so he brought a lot of that perspective into Chan and taught from that perspective, and kind of wrote a long rim. Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. Can I just um, take you back one more time to the suffering? Because I, I, I forget the quote, but I know your history major. Something about how how um, sorry, song. <laughs> how humans will get used to sufferable things. And, you know, whether you're talking about the Holocaust, you can look at politics and even like, you know, you're sick or you have like, you're, you're a heavy person and, and you're in pain, but it's odd because the moment the pain goes away, there's a distance that's created and you don't go back and fix what puts you in the suffering pain. Yep. And that could be physical or it could be like politics or economic systems. Like we, we suffer things. So it's odd that you tell jazz like humans would choose not to suffer. But like when you look, at least in the United States, I mean, look at the suffering we're all, basically signing up for and just going about and yep. and just suffering. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. We forget our past suffering, and so we keep creating the causes for more. Why, 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 why do you think we forget how much we suffer, though? Like when, when physical pain stops, why do you think the distance sort of Yeah, it, 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 I think it's a function of our ignorance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and the, and because whatever is happening at the moment, the the appearance to our senses is so strong that I think we just get sucked into it. So when the suffering stops and something nice happens, we're completely there, you know. And that's why too, when suffering comes, it's like this is never going to end because the the immediacy of uh, the appearance of, of this life is so strong. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really, it's, it's, it's not a good quality in us, actually, because it, it leads us to uh, do the same mistakes again and again. I was thinking about that um, recently, too, regarding, for example, what, I'm, you know, the Vietnam War. And if you learn things from the Vietnam War, 
then you see we're making the exact same mistakes now in Afghanistan and Syria. Yeah? Same not being able to tune into people's culture, not understanding their aspiration for self-rule, thinking that our way of doing things is the best way, imposing our beliefs on others without even thinking that that's what we're doing, without realizing that that's what we're doing. We're totally out to lunch, yeah? And this is really a function of our ignorance. So we keep creating, the as a nation and as individuals, you know, we keep doing the same mistakes, not learning from the suffering, you know? And that's a reason for a lot of compassion. Yeah. Because you see that all of that isn't necessary. It's only happening due to our ignorance. Mm 